your Bibles now to Ephesians. Ephesians, or as some would say, Ephesians. 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 People at Ephesusonia. Ephesians. You there? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians. I meant uh, to mention this evening, Brother John Swink called a little bit earlier before the service. Uh, they, he had done a service over John Knox Village this afternoon. And uh, when they were coming back, they someone ran a, a red light. I was going to say someone ran a green light and hit their car. And so they're okay, but they've got some vehicle damage. And, and so that's why he was really looking forward to the song service tonight and bringing his great aunt or his aunt and all that. Yeah, that's why he's not here. And he did call in earlier. So you just pray that the, all the circumstances will work out as far as that goes. Sometimes those uh, opportunities, those uh, uh, inadvertent meetings are opportunities. It's, uh, it's amazing. You know, you know when something like that happens that, that God's going to do something or He has a purpose. You know, you're on your way to church and you're prevented from going there. Why is that? Why would that be? Well, yeah, God's got something. In it. And uh, by the way, learn to learn to think that way. Learn to ask, well, God, you just changed my day. Allow my day to be changed. What's your purpose in it? What do you want to do in it? And uh, you'd be amazed when you have that perspective how your response is so different. You ever uh, prone to just go ahead and bluntly state the facts as they are without the consideration of how the person that you state the facts to uh, will feel or how they'll feel about you? And then later on you realize, well, boy, it's a good thing I handled this thing with more grace uh, than I was at first prone to because it was an opportunity. And there are a lot of those opportunities. I had one like that last week. Well, here we are in Ephesians. And if you look at the first verse of chapter 4, the first verse of chapter 5, and then we're going to go right on down to uh, verse 15 to uh, verse, verse uh, 20. Yeah, or through 21. And uh, we just have a, have a simple message this evening. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. Hey, watch out, Daniel. Don't, don't be sneezing. Angela has got disinfectant and alcohol, and she will spray you down. And she's going to, actually. You're, <laughs> sorry, bud. Uh, you should have, should have muffled that a little bit more. All of us have been shot today with alcohol and disinfectant. So. Anyway. All right, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And then down to verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual psalms, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So, Father, I pray that you would shed light and understanding on uh, the overall predominant theme of Ephesians here this evening as we look at it. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, Paul is writing a letter that is um, intended to be a real help. And if you study the church at Ephesus, you ever read through Acts and just look at the encounters that Paul had. And then you just you realize how much was invested in the church at Ephesus. You know they had uh, Timothy, you know Paul's son in the faith for a pastor, and there's just a lot invested. The Bible talks a lot about the church at Ephesus, and uh, there are some pretty specific commands. Of course, the pastors, the elders of the church at Ephesus, they were called together. Remember that before Paul went to Jerusalem, and they were warned to watch out, take heed to yourselves and the flock of God that's among you. And watch out because what was the warning to the church at Ephesus? Well, grievous wolves are going to come in. 
and I want to take advantage of the flock. And indeed, there are a lot of individuals who are trying to create a following today, trying to get believers uh, to really think a lot about their person. You have a, when you have um, uh, an individual who is leadership in a church and he's much spoken about, and seems like he's constantly being spoken about, it is a sure thing that Jesus has been supplanted by him. Uh, that Jesus isn't often spoken about. And uh, Paul uh, has a lot to say to that church at Ephesus, but he writes them a letter uh, really explaining to them how the, the mystery of the church uh, is, works. He addresses himself to them as the apostle uh, to the Gentiles. And so uh, in, in chapter 3, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, Word. And so in a day and age when uh, at first Christianity was known as a sect of Judaism because they were entirely uh, a Jewish uh, a Jewish uh, sect or Jewish uh, believers in Jesus. And now the Gentiles had uh, come into the church and been saved and had evidently received the fullness of, of the Holy Ghost. There were a lot of... God was working through them, but Paul had that special ministry of the apostles. He was the one who was the apostle to the Gentiles. Many times in Romans, he refers to himself that way as the apostle to the Gentiles. In other portions of the Scripture, in Acts, when he was told, when, when the believers were told that Paul had been saved, one of the things he was called to do was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So he was one of those individuals that uh, was a large part of bringing the Gentile and the Jewish believers together to where uh, it, it was... They, the, the people got a clear understanding of what the church was. The church was a new thing in the first century, wasn't it? There been a church before the first century? No, no. There had, uh, there had been believers in God, but uh, they had had to go to the temple to worship God before, uh, before the work of the cross was completed. And so to get to God, like Jesus told the woman at the well, said, you know what? The... She had, she had proposed to him that it was just as legitimate to worship God on the mountain as it was in the temple. What, what did Jesus tell him? Yeah, you have to worship God in spirit and truth. God is a spirit. They that worship Him with must worship in spirit and truth. He said the salvations of the Jews. And so you've got to go to God God's way. Now Paul is a person who persecuted Jesus, persecuted the church of Christ, He's become the apostle to the Gentiles. One of the things he urges in Ephesians is unity. And uh, for believers to behave in a way that, uh, that represents Jesus Christ. So I love what he says in verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. He talks about behaviors of lost people and how that the behavior for the children of God are different. Verse 8, he said that you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light, and the Lord walk as children of light. And I always find it encouraging that believers have to be urged to live and act like believers. Your works are not what save you. Faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you. But the witness and the testimony of a believer is of vital importance, not only in winning one another, not only in encouraging one another, but certainly in our testimony to the lost. This morning at Teen Sunday School, we were in... Uh, it's a uh, First uh, Peter uh, four fifteen, um, where we as believers are to be ready to have an answer to anyone uh, that asks you the hope that lies within you. And it, I'll tell you something: you don't live you don't live like a believer. No one's going to ask you why you have such great hope. You got to live for Jesus Christ. This one saves you, but it's valid and it uh, validates uh, for lots of people. Validates that there's something different about you, and so. Uh, I want to go down now to verse 15. And uh, he's given the way that a believer ought to live. And it's just kind of fitting with the theme of our service this evening as we've had a praise service tonight. Singing service and singing is all about praise. Praise in the Lord Jesus. And verse uh, 15, he said, See then that ye walk circumspectly. Circumspectly. Uh, not as fools, but as wise. As a person who is circumspect, of course, we have some words that are derivatives of the same term. 
uh, words that, that have to do with the circumvention or getting around, going around someone. And the idea of walking circumspectly really carries the idea of looking around. Looking around. <laughs> you ever, you ever uh, drive by a school zone on uh, early morning or after school's out? I do every day when I pick up or drop off Anthony. One of the things I notice is all the people who are in their little zone, but they're not like actually, you know, aware of anything around them. And you know, I think that's why we need speed limits in school zones. They did have them back in the days before every kid had a cell phone and earbuds. But I think that the real need for school for speed limits in school zones today is just people that just don't have a clue what's going on around them. And if you're going too fast, you won't be able to dodge them when they walk out in front of you. But I mean, you'd see them. Just walking, yeah. Just walk into whatever they're looking at a cell phone. They got the earbuds in, and all kinds of things are happening around them, and they don't have a clue. Circumspect, you know. You ever I met the guy that's a little bit uh, cagey and a little bit worried about, you know, he thinks everybody's out to get him, and so goes to a restaurant. And he sits with his back to the wall, you know, and watches everybody that comes in and memorizes faces, and you know, circumspect. That's the idea, like looking out. You know, I know a lot of people. You, know, you go to a restaurant, I got to sit in the corner. You know, they want their back to the wall. You know, not me. I want to hide in a closet somewhere and jump out at people. I don't want to sit in the corner. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that when we walk as believers, we're supposed to be aware of what's going on around us. You know, I think it's rather important sometimes just to have your fingers on the pulse of uh, theological trends and of uh, worldly trends in the church. There are a lot of theological trends that come and that go. And it's important that as believers, we be circumspect. We see it come, we see it go. I've seen, I, I'm only 40, but I've seen a lot of trends come and go. I, I say, oh, here it comes again. You can see it, seen it before, seeing it again. And it happens over and again. And you watch people rise on the scene, flash in the pan. They uh, come in with the same false doctrine, same suppositions. And the foolish people that don't know the Word of God always seem to come along and follow. And then, guess what? They're exposed or uh, the truth ultimately prevails and they go back uh, into hiding and then the thing comes out again. And as a believer, we need to be circumspect. How do you walk circumspectly from a practical perspective? How does a person walk, not as a fool, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil? It means be aware. Now, how can you be aware? You know the best way is the old counterfeit analogy? You need to know what the truth is so that you know what error is. You know what truth is, so you know what error is. And when you know the Word of God, and uh, you study the Word of God, then you know when something, man, with the help of the Holy Spirit, just has a ring uh, of falsehood about it. And so walk circumspectly. Know the Word of God. Know what the Word of God says. Listen to me. If you think you can arrive at a theological conclusion, but you couldn't pass a Bible test... How are you going to walk circumspectly? Think of it. Think of it. Uh, last, last week I wasted a little bit of time before service in Miami Beach trolling on Facebook somebody that was God-hating. And uh, that I, uh, I was just trolling. I mean, that's, that's what it was. That's what I was doing. And they were saying some really hateful things about God and they were asking some questions. So I answered some of their questions and uh, kind of called them out, I guess, a little bit on a few things uh, that, they, that they were saying. And... Uh, one of the things that I called them out on was, you know, they're bashing the Bible, but I call them out on the reality that they never read it. I dare, so dare you read the Bible? Dare you read the Bible? You never read the Bible. You tell me, oh, it's got, it's got contradictions, it's got errors, it's got da, 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 da. Yeah, you Googled that. Google some, some of the contradictions and then Google the answers for the contradictions. You'll find both. You know, you can, you can Google problems and you can Google solutions to the problems. All I did is just taking a position and finding the one that you like. Isn't it? You know, supporting, finding support for the position that you like. You never read the Bible. I dare you. Hey, listen. How many of you could pass a test on the minor prophets? How many of you could? How many of you could just give me an outline uh, for Isaiah, or for Ezekiel, or for Daniel? Could you? Could you give me an outline for Jeremiah? Could you give me an outline for Malachi? Uh, could you give me an outline for Romans? I mean, there are so many fools that think they just know. Doctrine from Romans 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and they don't have a clue what's in chapters 4 through 7. They don't know. 
They might know a little bit of chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it's a power. They know Romans 1.16. They don't have a clue from chapters uh, 2 through 8. It's the forgotten portion of Romans that settles us in our faith. And that really lays the groundwork for what God is going to do with Israel in the future. And there are all kinds of people that develop their doctrines from chapters, sometimes 7, but usually... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Hey, they couldn't give you an outline. Couldn't give you an outline for Romans. And you do not know anything further on in Romans if you don't know the theme that was established in the beginning of it. You can go ahead and pick your topic, but you have taken the Word of God so far out of context, you're a fool. Walk circumspectly. Better know what the Word of God says. Do you know what the theme of... Could you, could you give a Bible theme? If I gave you a 66... A 66-question test that said just write one sentence. In one sentence, write the theme of every book of the Bible. What's the biblical theme of it? Don't tell me if you couldn't pass that test that uh, you're able to walk circumspectly. That'll be a challenge for us. You don't know what the Word of God says. How do you know what even anything around you means? How do you know it's good or bad? If you don't have the sieve of God's Word to filter it through. They walk circumspectly, you know, in the in the light, uh, looking, keep an eye out for what's around you. Uh, you know, they say that history repeats itself, and that's one of the reasons it's important to study history. Well, you know what? There's a lot of history in the Word of God. You know, you read the history of the early church, you can just see this. It, 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 it's comical, isn't it? To see the resurgence of doctrinal error. And, you know, they had it in Thessalonica, and they had it in Ephesus, and they had it in Corinth, and they had the same problems, but because people don't know what the Word of God says about it, they either don't know it's a problem, or they don't know what to do about the problem, or they don't know what the answer for the problem is. And so walk circumspectly. And the Bible says, um, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Redeem is to buy back, or uh, you ever, ever uh, get stuck with tokens? Uh, car wash tokens, uh, the you know, the game places, tokens. You know, you, you have coins at your house. Or even worse than tokens, Canadian money. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's more worthless than a token, isn't it? You know, you travel, it's one thing to keep some money from another country as a souvenir. Look, I got a million dollars. It's worth about 50 cents, you know, maybe in, uh, in uh, American economy or U.S. economy. But the reality of it is that uh, you ever have something, you know, and you didn't redeem it? I, you know, I, I'm going to say this. I, man, I, I had some boomers tokens for forever. I finally threw them away. I'll never go there. You know, I should have used them while I was there or sold them to some unsuspecting kid or ground them down and used them in a, in a vending machine to buy bubble gum or something. Got something out of them. But <laughs> the reality of it is redeem is to cash in or to get buy back, to get something back for it. And we have time that God's given to us. And it is... And an amount of time that we're told to number our days. So we're supposed to, you know, have a conscious awareness of how much time we, we think we have. We're not supposed to worry about tomorrow, but we're supposed to plan tomorrow. We're supposed to have a plan for the future. And we're supposed to redeem the time, the Bible says, because the days are evil. Now, if you're uh, ignorant of the Scripture, you think that evil only has the term, it's, that it's only a synonym uh, for wicked, and it isn't. The word evil it really is a word that has to do with eminence. It means it's, it's coming fast, going to get you by surprise, going to get you unaware. What in the world does it mean that the days are evil for a believer? What's that mean? They redeem the time. Days are evil. What's it mean? All right, save the time. Well, okay, that's redeem the time. It means to save it or to, to get something for it. Cash it in. Use it. I think our nature and I think all of what uh, culture would tell us around us would lead us to fritter away the minutes and the hours in things that are not redeemed. And so... The days are evil. Our, 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 our focus is on redeeming the time, on sort of pushing back against the easiest way to use up the time. You sort of blink and it's gone. It's, it's, it's what'd you say? It's what? It's easier. It's probably yeah, easier. You said it's gone. 
It's called, Lord, yeah. probably easier to troll somebody on Facebook, right? We'll just say play on Facebook <laughs> than it is to actually like read something meaningful. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, whether it's God's word or, or a study help or you know get through it, you know, chapter, so we can pass that test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, the days are evil. It simply means that Jesus is coming in the sky. He's going to call us up. When? When's it coming? Huh? Well, who knows? Who knows when Jesus is coming? Only God knows. Yeah, only God knows. Yeah. So, how much time do you have till Jesus comes? Hmm? How much time do you have? Minutes. Only God knows. I might not have to drive home tonight. Don't know. The days are evil. In other words, you better not waste time. You don't. You don't even know how much you have, and. Uh, if 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 we tarry until the Lord's coming, that may not be long. Days are evil, imminent. Uh, it's an imminence concept. Verse seventeen: Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You get your theology wrong, you won't know what God's purpose is. You don't walk circumspectly. You're not careful. You won't know what God's trying to accomplish. It really comes into understanding or really gets honed in and defined in verses 18, 19, and 20, doesn't it? And be not drunk with wine where is in excess, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Why should a believer, why ought a believer be more than just sealed or indwelt or comforted? Are ministered to by the Spirit of God. See, it's not talking about, you know, experience the sealing work of the Holy Ghost. Experience the comforting of the Holy Ghost. That's not what the Bible says. It says, be filled with the Spirit. And it's a continuous present. I think most of us have heard that preached plenty of times, which means be a continually filled or be a being filled. In other words, right now you should be Spirit-filled, and uh, you need to be continually spirit-filled. And it's a command. It's not something that is, you know, stand back and let God do what He's going to do. It's a seek the filling. Where it's on purpose, be filled with God's Spirit. What, is that, what does that mean? What is that for? Being ye filled with the, whole, with the Spirit. Well, if we're supposed to be circumspect and we're supposed to be redeeming the time and that fits within our immediate context, what is the work of the Spirit through the fullness of power? What does the Spirit of God do? What happened at Pentecost? Somebody please tell me. People got saved. The very individuals who cried crucify Him were pricked to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's what happened when the fullness of the Spirit came down. The Gospel was preached in the fullness of power and the Spirit of God used it to convict hard-hearted, wicked souls who days before I cried, crucify Him. And they turned to Jesus Christ and they gladly received His Word and they were baptized. That's what happens when the Holy Ghost, uh, when a person's filled with the Holy Spirit. Study Acts sometime. You know, we call it Acts. It means actions. Acts, sometimes they say Acts of the Apostles, which is true. I mean, the Apostles established the church and God used them as a foundational gift to the church. It's true. But Acts is really the Acts of the Holy Ghost. It's a response of what happened to men of God when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And every time there was a great filling of God's Spirit, the Gospel was preached in great power and souls were saved. Be redeeming the time because the days are evil. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Why? I don't want to spend time this evening talking about alcohol. Wine is not alcohol. Alcohol means alcohol. Wine means wine. Uh, wine is a word oinos. Yes, yeah, uh, juice can, can be alcoholic. It can be fermented, but that happens on purpose, not by mistake. Um, try it sometime. with if I'm not saying try it. I'm saying you, you could try it. You'd find out the predictable results I'm about to tell you. If you leave juice alone for a prolonged period of time, It'll go rotten. It'll turn into vinegar. And it'll have some alcoholic content. Try and chug down enough to get drunk. 
See if you can. Uh, now, we're drunk in here, though. The word drunk is more akin to a word for gluttony than it is for alcoholic. Now, can wine be alcoholic? Can, it, can wine be alcoholic? Yes. Can wine be non-alcoholic? Yes, wine means juice. That's what wine means. I'm so tired of hearing Christians spew the nonsense. Uh, they just, just assume, because the word wine is used, that it means what it means in, in uh, the English language, that it's an alcoholic beverage. Yes, they had alcoholic beverages in the first century. And yes, they knew how to be, how to be drunken fools. But the Bible talks enough about wine that I'm pretty certain here that the Scripture is not urging believers to please stop getting drunk. Does that make sense? Please stop drinking and getting drunk. Now, you, know, you might want to consider not you know, being drunk. Really? No. It's talking about the passions of the flesh. Control of flesh. Um, <laughs> this is convicting for me. I just bare my soul here and just tell you, man, gluttony, I'll tell you what. It's a thing. You know, that whole... You know, asking yourself the question, why am I standing in front of the fridge at 2 a.m.? You know, I'm like scraping the, you know, the, the, the sleepers out of my eyes and looking in the fridge and trying to, I'm like, why am I looking for something to eat at 2 a.m.? Why, why is this? Because <laughs> I'm controlled by the flesh and not the spirit. My flesh says, get up and eat something. I lose sleep to eat. Yeah, you know, it's like we need to be spirit filled as believers, controlled by the Spirit of God. And when you are controlled by the Spirit of God, there are natural impulses uh, that are affected by that. First of all, you'll be in control of your fleshly excesses, and instead, you'll have spiritual I don't want to use the word excess, it's probably wrong, but spiritual fullness. And then the Bible says the result with that would be that you would, your manner would be. Uh, speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What happens a lot of times when believers get together? Well, they start debating and arguing and, and uh, discussing. But how often do they get to literally experiencing God in their lives and having the effects of it? Have you ever been close to the Lord and not had a song in your heart? You just walked and fell. What happens when you fellowship with the Lord? The song just comes out. Man, you make up your own songs, right? You start to read a verse of the Bible and you start singing the verse. It just gets in. Singing and making melody in your heart uh, to each other. To the Lord. You know, God, God loves our song, doesn't He? He loves the song of a heart of a people that are Spirit-filled. And uh, the Bible talks a lot about a new song. Yeah, it talks a lot about the song. Colossians says, "Let the word of God dwell in you richly." And uh, boy, what a what a help that is! Speaking yourselves in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, sing, make melody in your hearts, Lord. Um, <coughs> verse nine. I, I mixed up Colossians and, and Ephesians five, which I oftentimes do. But uh, no, let's see. Colossians, what's Colossians three? How's it go? Let me let me just look it up so I don't misquote it. I just. I just mixed it. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Somebody changed it. They took it out of the Bible. Verse 16. Uh, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing grace in your heart with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And verse 19 of Ephesians is speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You get the impression that for all the churches, that was sort of an important matter, wasn't it? You ever look at how brief? You know, you, you, we, we, we have divided up Ephesians into six chapters. Really, it's just a letter, one letter. You ever realize how brief a letter is when you only have this to say to a church? And then you think about how important everything that's included in those letters are, especially by an individual that the Holy Spirit really used uh, his communication skills and intellect. The Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit of God just really used his ability to communicate. And a lot of the things that he said, they weren't superfluous. They weren't extra. They were on purpose, on point. And uh, this is... Uh, in
recognizes, of course, the importance of what's said here. Now, then the Bible says as well, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's another mannerism that comes from a spirit-filled believer. Gratitude. Gratitude. It's a sure sign. It's a sure sign that you're walking in the flesh and not the spirit when your immediate response to anything is not gratitude. And listen, you have so much to be thankful for. You have so much to be thankful for. Uh, your circumstance. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I've been through. Everybody has. <laughs> Three words. You ain't special in that way. Now, it's six words total, but you ain't special is the part I want you to get. You're not special. You're not the only person in the world who's ever had uh, hardship or ever had anything to go through. Everybody has. <coughs> and you have a lot to be thankful for. Do you hear me tonight? You have a lot to be thankful for. If you would take the time to be Spirit-filled, it would occur to you how much you have and how bright your future is. Uh, it doesn't matter what your past is. Uh, God can give you grace. He can give you victory. But your future is so bright, my friend. I like when Tony used to wear the shades in his video. he say, why are you wearing sunglasses? Because I can see the future. And it's very bright. And, uh, you know, the reality of it is, is that... As believers, can't we? Can we not see the future? Can you see the future? It's revealed to us in God's Word. The outcome is perfect. I mean, it just... It's, it's the best it could possibly be. We as believers are predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We'd be just like Jesus. Now, isn't that grand? Could it be better than that? No. Uh, the outlook, the future is bright, and the response of a spirit-filled believer is to be thankful, giving thanks for everything and all things. Hey, you know something? The things that remind you that this is a sin-cursed world, you ought to be thankful for. You know those pains that don't go away? I ought to remind you that, that, that I'm in a body of sin, but someday I'm going to get a new one, get new clothes. I'm going to be clothed with a body which is eternal in the heavens. That's going to be good. Be thankful for it. Um, you say, Pastor, some people are in abject misery 24-7. I hope God doesn't make me be the example to prove them wrong. But I know people whose circumstances most people would say are terrible. They know they've got a lot to be thankful for. So do you and I. Matter of fact, this evening, if we were to close out uh, with thanksgiving and just praise, the things we'd be most thankful for, if you reflect on it, would be the adversity and some of the things in life that really showed us who God is, how much we need Him, how much He loves us. Isn't that true? If I'm going to share a praise, I'm first going to talk about something that looked like it was terrible and then look at how God gave me grace in that circumstance. And then, ultimately, I'm just going to say, <laughs> I have so much to be thankful for. The very worst of things are the best of things, aren't they? For a person who's filled with the Spirit. And so that's another, another evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Being thankful, uh, giving thanks always for all things. For what? All things. Ephesians is not a prison epistle. Most of Paul's letters were. When he talks about Thanksgiving, we're talking about a guy that has been through it. And hasn't he? And um, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, God, thank You tonight. In Jesus' name, thank You so much for the things that we have to express gratitude for. <clears throat> Father, really, we would have to call our difficulty a light affliction which is but for a moment. Knowing that it works in us a far more eternal weight of glory. And only God, only You, could 
work in such a way as to make evil good and to make affliction something for which we owe gratitude. And God, it just speaks to your character. It speaks to your promise. It speaks to your love and your graciousness, your goodness. God, you're so good. And this evening, we really want to cap off our day. Lord, we've had a good day. And we just want to end it by being grateful. We want to end it by praising You and reminding ourselves that You are worthy of all praise. We thank You for this. In Jesus' name, Amen.